Why are so many organizations against raw feeding your dog or cat? According to those who feed raw, raw meat-based diets are absolutely safe for dogs and have so many benefits like shinier coats, muscle mass gains, and cleaner teeth. Despite this, the American Veterinary Medical Association, the American Animal Hospital Association, the Delta Society, and the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association all have statements advising against feeding your dog or cat a raw diet. Most of their concerns involve safety. Raw food is highly linked to several infectious diseases, ones that can be transmitted to owners. There's also concerns about poor formulation, even in commercial diets. In this video, I'm going to discuss why I personally don't recommend feeding your dog or cat raw food. To me, the risk is not worth the benefit, and those benefits are not exclusive to raw and are mostly anecdotal or based on dubious information. Let's start with safety. Raw food diets have a high risk of contamination. The unfortunate truth is if I made a video with all the recent cases of infection from raw food, it would be several hours long. For that reason, I'm gonna focus on major studies. A study from 2014 compared dry, semi-moist, and raw food. Out of 480 samples of dry and semi-moist dog and cat food, only one dry cat food had salmonella. One dry cat food had listeria. None were positive for listeria monocytogenes or E. coli O157H7. The 576 samples of raw dog food and cat food, exotic animal food, and jerky treats yielded much different results. 15 samples, which makes up 8%, were positive for salmonella, all of which were in raw food products. 32 samples, 16%, had listeria monocytogenes, again, all raw food. 34 samples, which is 14%, had other listeria species, mixed between raw and jerky type treats. No samples had E. coli O157H7, but 10 samples were positive for other types of E. coli. It's not just salmonella, listeria, and E. coli you need to worry about. There's also the outbreak of tuberculosis in raw fed cats in the UK, 45 cats developed clinical tuberculosis, and 77 had latent or subclinical infections. These cases stretch from July of 2018 to January of 2021. There's also risk of brucellosis, like a case in the Netherlands where a dog was then euthanized. And it's not just the presence of these contaminants, it's that they're often antibiotic resistant. A study released last year out of Portugal looked at 55 food samples, 22 wet, 14 raw frozen, eight dry, seven treats, and four semi-moist. Only the raw samples tested positive for gram-negative bacteria. This included Salmonella, E. coli, and Klebsiella. In their E. coli isolates, they found resistance to beta-lactams, fluoroquinolones, tetracyclines, and sulfonamides. You can find several very similar studies with a quick PubMed search. And I'd be remiss if I didn't include the cats who've died from H5N1 due to their raw food, with two brands implicated at the time of this writing. Whenever I bring these studies up, raw food proponents are quick to bring up that salmonella can be found in kibble as well. And that's absolutely true. If you look at recent recalls, most salmonella found in kibble is due to contamination at the plant. In one example, rodent activity led to contamination. Thankfully, these sources of contamination are uncommon and usually due to outside sources. This differs from raw, where the contamination is in the meat itself. There's a lot of myths that circulate about raw-fed animals and their ability to withstand infection. It's true that not all species of salmonella or E. coli are pathogenic. Some do not cause disease. This does not mean that all strains of salmonella do not cause disease. I think this is where the common myth that dogs and cats can't get salmonella comes from. This is not true. You can do a quick PubMed search and see several cases of dogs and cats infected by salmonella. There's also evidence of asymptomatic shedding of salmonella in feces. In an experimental study where 16 dogs were fed one salmonella contaminated commercial raw food diet, seven dogs went on to shed salmonella one to seven days after consumption. They did this without any clinical signs. The strain of salmonella was Heidelberg, which is typically among the five most common serovars causing human salmonella infections and has been responsible for several outbreaks in the United States and Canada. Along with this myth is the idea that dogs cannot get salmonella because their saliva has antimicrobial properties against it. This is patently false and likely based off a study from 1990 that showed a dog's saliva was bactericidal against E. coli and strep canis and slightly against staph and pseudomonas. A newer 2022 study found that canine saliva was rich in bacteria with antimicrobial resistance genes, such as bacterioides, cornybacterium, fusobacterium, pastorella, and more. 
They had antimicrobial resistant genes for aminoglycosides, cephalosporins, among many, many other antibiotics. I've also been told that dog stomachs are too acidic for most of these contaminants. Stomach pH changes depending on fasted or non-fasted states, but in general, human stomachs are more acidic than dogs. So by this reasoning, humans would never get listeria or E. coli or salmonella, which is not true. I'm gonna take a quick aside here to talk about methods used by raw food companies to prevent contamination. First, let's talk human grade. The term human grade is thrown around a lot. AFCO addressed this in 2023 by creating guidelines, as many companies were just using the term. In the AFCO defined feed term human grade, the use of the term human grade is only acceptable in reference to the product as a whole. The feed term specifies that every ingredient and the resulting product must be stored, handled, processed, and transported in a manner that is consistent and compliant with 21 CFR Part 117 and all other applicable federal human food laws as required by ingredient, process, and or facility type. Part of that definition means that it is ready to eat, which means safe to eat without additional preparation, although they may receive additional preparation, for example, reheating, for better taste or appearance. I wanna mention something about human food and animal food that's very different. In pet food, there is a zero tolerance policy for salmonella and listeria. This differs from human food where they estimate one in every 25 packages of chicken at the grocery store have salmonella. Why is this allowed when pet food has a zero tolerance? Because raw chicken is sold with the intention to be cooked. Utilizing human grade poultry is one way that raw brands have tried to limit exposure to H5N1. Their thought process is since these food items are pre-screened for H5N1, any human grade raw food should not have H5N1 contamination when it reaches the facility. Some raw food brands are adamant that no processing should be done on the raw food as it will degrade the nutrients. Others use tools such as HPP. What is this and what's the evidence that it works? HPP stands for high pressure pasteurization or processing, where the food is subjected to elevated pressures at ambient or chilled temperatures. It works by damaging cell membranes, ribosomes, and enzymes of these bacteria. If the pressure is insufficient, it may only injure a portion of the bacteria, which can then recover during storage time, which has been noted in studies. It's said to inactivate harmful and spoilage microorganisms. However, it does not inactivate bacterial spores. It's recognized by the FSIS and USDA as a post-lethality treatment for listeria, and there's evidence that it decreases the presence of salmonella at 300 and 400 MPA for at least a minute at 86 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. There's little evidence of HPP and its effect on H5N1, but there is a paper using it for H7N7, which found it lost its infectivity at 460 MPA at one minute, though it did not note a temperature. While this sounds promising, in practice, it doesn't seem to be as effective. For example, Blue Ridge Beef uses HPP in all their raw food and has had four recalls in the last year for salmonella and listeria. Primal Pet Foods also uses HPP and had a recall in 2022 due to listeria. Stella and Chewy's, who also uses HPP, had a recall in 2015 for listeria. This begs the question, is HPP as effective as we think at reducing these pathogen burdens? An abstract from 2018 inoculated raw beef with E. coli and found a reduction in the amount of E. coli, but not an elimination. This was done at 600 MPA for 480 seconds. Is this an issue in the post-processing period? Are these companies not utilizing the right temperature or time to make their HPP effective? Or does it come down to the raw food itself? And these methods aren't tested or validated for raw dog or cat food. In truth, it's probably a mix of all of these and HPP should be seen as a way to reduce pathogens, not necessarily eliminate them. Whenever I talk about the safety of raw diets, I inevitably get comments about how often kibble is recalled. This is a mix of a base rate fallacy and a lack of understanding how recalls work, but that's a video for another day. Pet food is a $73 billion market with raw food making up 4.32 billion of that. That means that 6% of the total revenue of pet food is raw. These dollar amounts don't line up with the actual amount of raw food sold because food is not all priced the same. Let's look at recalls in pet foods over the last few years. In 2022, there were four overall recalls, one livestock, one cat kibble, one raw dog food, and one from Family Dollar, which was a mix of human food, pet food, and other items. In this year, raw food made up 25% of the total recalls. In 2023, there were 17 total recalls, with eight of them involving dog or cat food. Of those eight, two were raw and six were kibble. 
That means 11% of the total recalls were raw food, and of the dog or cat food, raw made up 25%. In 2024, there were 17 total recalls, with five involving dog or cat food. Of that, kibble made up one recall and raw made up four. That means 23% of total recalls were raw food, and 80% of the dog or cat food recalled was raw. Despite raw food making up about 6% of the total market, it accounts for over half of all the dog and cat food recalled in the last three years. None of this is to say that kibble is not recalled or that kibble is not recalled for similar issues like salmonella. You can see that through the data that's freely available through the FDA. What's most concerning to me are the raw food brands that were asked to recall and did not. You can see this letter from the FDA to Aero Reliance Inc., the company that processes Darwin's raw food, that a pet allegedly became sick from salmonella from their food. The FDA told them to recall and also told them the method they use to clean their food, peroxidic acid, is not an approved or safe method and thus the food is adulterated. The company told the FDA to prove that salmonella typhurium is actually bad. How a company responds to a recall is just as important as the fact that a recall itself is issued. You'll notice that Darwin has several letters from the FDA, but is not featured on the recall list from the FDA. But safety isn't just about contamination. It's also about balance. The Association of American Feed Control Officials, or AFCO, is a nonprofit organization that exists to guide state, federal, and international feed regulators with ingredients, definitions, label standards, and laboratory standards. They do not regulate, test, approve, or certify food. They create guidelines that can be adopted into law. As such, they have nutrient profiles. Studies have compared these guidelines to commercial and homemade raw foods and found serious concerns. One study found unbalanced calcium to phosphorus ratios, one high, one low, and high vitamin D in homemade diets. The commercial diets were also high in vitamin D. They were also deficient in potassium, magnesium, zinc, and iron, while others were high in magnesium, zinc, and vitamin E. The homemade diets were fed in accordance with the BARF diet regimen, the ultimate diet regimen, or the Volhard diet regimen. There's also reports of dogs developing rickets from raw meat-based home-prepared diets. Other studies conducted on homemade raw diets found 60% had serious imbalances. Homemade diets with poor formulation is not exclusive to raw food diets. Many studies have shown that recipes found in books or online failed to meet all essential nutrient requirements for adult maintenance. The problem is many raw advocates put recipes online for owners uninterested in commercial raw diets. As stated above, those diets are not well formulated. At the time of this video, I only know of one commercial raw food company that employs a boarded nutritionist, and that's Instinct. These safety concerns are a huge chunk of why most organizations and veterinarians don't recommend raw. And these are not nebulous ideas, it fits with owners' experiences. In 2024, a survey of 802 pet owners that had stopped feeding raw were surveyed. The top reasons owners stopped feeding raw was due to intolerance of the diet, which was expressed exclusively in GI signs, 20% stopped feeding due to disease, and 64% of those were GI disease. Those who feed raw diets often use the term biologically appropriate raw food, or BARF. They use this term to play on the idea that dogs and cats should eat like their wild relatives, that dogs evolved from wolves and therefore they should eat like wolves. First and foremost, dogs and wolves parted evolutionary ways between 9,000 and 34,000 years ago. Genomic sequencing puts dogs and wolves as more like sister groups that share a common ancestor instead of evolving from one. In fact, there are 36 regions of the genome that differ between dogs and wolves. 10 of those play a role in starch and fat metabolism. This was likely so they could thrive on diets rich in starch, which differs from the carnivorous wolf diets. That's ignoring that gray wolves to live to be five to seven years old in the wild, and feral or village dogs only live to be about two to five years of age. This is likely due to many factors outside the diet, but it's something to consider that the dietary needs of a roaming animal that is several thousand years removed from our domestic dogs are not biologically appropriate. When it comes to cats, the argument is that cats remained obligate carnivores during domestication. This does not mean that they should only eat meat, just that their protein metabolism is unique and they have high maintenance requirements for protein in the diet. They lack salivary amylase, and their intestinal amylase is mostly produced by the pancreas. Nevertheless, cats absolutely can use carbohydrates in their diet. Many people get hung up on the statement, carbohydrates are not essential nutrients for cats. 
In nutrition, essential means it cannot be synthesized by the body, so they must get it from external dietary sources. Non-essential does not mean does not need or is bad for them. In fact, carbohydrates are not considered essential nutrients for humans either. Many studies purporting benefits exclusive to raw food use data from the Dog Risk Food Frequency Questionnaire. This is a survey of 12,000 dog owners to draw correlations between diet, environmental factors, and chronic disease. Like with most questionnaires, there's the concern with recall bias. Owners are asked to remember exact diets, times of diagnosis of disease, etc. across their pet's life. Indeed, when analyzed, it was found 244 owners who had answered the questionnaire twice, three who answered three times, and one who answered four times. In that same analysis, they tried to validate using the data from the survey for atopy in dogs. Of the dogs that were listed as having atopy by owners, 31% of the owners report that the diagnosis was not verified by veterinary workup. There are about 117 diseases listed in this data set, and validating all of them is not possible. It begs the question, can this data be used reliably for some of the more complex diseases? While owners seem to be able to recall more straightforward diagnosis, such as hypothyroidism, what about more complex diseases? Researchers also mentioned throwing out about 13% of responses because they were robot answers, with no further information on how that's decided or what that means. Despite the fact that atopy diagnosis may not be correct or validated, there have been studies based on this data set about atopy. One such study claimed that raw-fed dogs in puppyhood had less atopic dermatitis as adults. They found that puppyhood exposure to raw animal-based foods may have protective influence on ASS indices in adulthood. One curiosity I had with this data set is the lack of inclusion of parental atopy. Another study by the same researchers a year prior found a striking genetic association with atopy. The dogs with a maternal history of CAD were at a higher risk to develop CAD when becoming adults while those without a maternal history of CAD had a low chance of developing CAD during adulthood. This is not new. There's a study involving golden retrievers that found two atopic parents resulted in 65% atopic offspring, breeding one atopic parent resulted in 21 to 57% atopic offspring, and breeding two non-atopic parents resulted in an 11% atopic offspring. This is also ignoring the serious bias in these studies, where the researchers say things like, pets are usually served ultra-processed foods with a high carbohydrate content, and go on to break the diets into non-processed meat diets and ultra-processed carbohydrate-based diets, despite the fact that dry diets have ranges of carbohydrates. They also go on to call dogs carnivores, a fact that's not supported by current literature. It's unfortunate that this questionnaire data is repeatedly used as proof that benefits exist exclusively to raw food. The data itself is questionable, and yet they release study after study on it. The crux of the argument is this. Feeding raw food is risky for both your pet and for yourself. There's no compelling evidence that feeding raw gives any benefit over other types of food. This is the reason most veterinarians don't recommend a raw-fed diet, and the reason why many veterinarians don PPE when dealing with raw-fed dogs and cats. I hope this helps you to understand where the veterinary field is coming from when they recommend transitioning dogs and cats off raw food diets. If you'd like more information on this topic, I've linked all my sources on my Substack. I also refer people to several sources when discussing raw food. Firstly, this review by Freeman et al. This review takes information from 101 sources to give a synopsis on current knowledge about raw food in dogs and cats. I also like Dr. Brennan McKenzie's blog, The SkeptVet, and Dr. Weiss's blog, Worms and Germs. They're both excellent science communicators and cite their sources, as well as give interesting insight into studies. If you're concerned about formulation of a homemade diet, please talk to a boarded veterinary nutritionist or use resources such as Balance It to formulate a cooked diet at home. And lastly, you should always consult with your veterinarian about your pet.